Oh, good evening, everybody. I, I must say that it, it, to me, it is really an honor to be here tonight. So thank you, Ken, for inviting me. And, and I really um, hope and pray that this is a, a fun evening and a provocative evening where together we will learn to think through what I think to be an incredibly important issue uh, that's going to be confronting the church and our culture at large. And I want to start this morning, or this evening, I guess, uh, in California time, but even then it would still be this afternoon. So I'm just messed up the time, jet lag, but or something like that. Yeah, but it's morning somewhere, right? But uh, but this evening I want to start by just asking a question, a little bit of a, a, a serious question. Uh, do any of you know somebody who has suffered from uh, a stroke or, or a traumatic brain injury? Right, a few of you, uh, and. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's horrifying when that happens for not only the patient, but for friends and family members. I mean, those kind of medical events are literally life-altering for, again, not only the patient, but the family. And the prognosis almost always is not really good. And I remember when um, I was in college, uh, my father having the first of his two strokes, and luckily, the first stroke was a mild stroke, but I can remember seeing my father in the hospital bed just after the stroke, and it was just really, really frightening. And luckily, you know, it didn't impact his speech or his cognition, and he was slightly weakened on his left side, but you wouldn't know that he had a stroke uh, after the first stroke if you didn't, you know, unless uh, you really were paying close attention. But the second stroke was devastating. Uh, it, it just robbed him of his ability to, to put thoughts together in a coherent way. Uh, it impacted his speech. He was weakened. He, we couldn't leave him uh, by himself anymore. And that was really sad on a number of fronts, but particularly it was sad because my father was a nuclear physicist. He was, in fact, one of the brightest people I've ever known, even to this very day. And he was in, uh, uh, a college professor and he was known for his, his intellect. He was intimidating to be around. He was such a brilliant person. I remember um, meeting people who had my father for physics in college as I, was, as I got a little bit older, and they found out who I was and, who my, and they knew my father. And they would just tell me it, he was an intimidating presence. He would walk into the classroom, and people would just tremble at, at me and my father's presence. And he was a really stern you know, guy, too, on top of that. But just for you know, fun, this is a picture of my father in his glory as a nuclear physicist in the lab. Uh, but it was sad to see somebody who was really defined by their intelligence being rendered, again, basically incapable of, of coherent thought. And you know, that is maybe one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so attracted to the story of Rosemary Johnson. I don't know if any of you have heard of Rosemary Johnson's story. She actually has gained some prominence, but in the 1980s, she was an emerging star in the classical music scene. She was, in her early 20s, had earned a seat uh, with the Welsh National Opera Orchestra in the United Kingdom as a violinist, and on the way to a performance was in an automobile accident. This would have been 1988. Was left in a coma for seven months, and then when she came out of the coma, she had lost the ability to speak. She lost the ability for movement and was literally trapped in her own body for decades. And this is actually changing for her uh, now, thanks to a, an interesting project being headed up by a neuroscientist by the name of Eduardo Miranda. And Eduardo Miranda is at Plymouth University and also has a joint appointment with the Royal Hospital of Neurodisability in London, and is heading up a project called the Computer Brain Interface Project or sort of the Computer Brain Music Interface Project. And the idea behind this project is very interesting. He's developed essentially a modified EEG cap that allows the patient to control computer software uh, with their minds. And uh, what these patients can do is select musical notes and musical phrases and use that to compose music. So it's a way for them to begin to express themselves musically. In fact, Eduardo Miranda pointed out that he focused on music as the mode of expression because with music, not only can you communicate thoughts and ideas, but emotions and feelings, which is really very important for these types of patients. Now, what's interesting is that 
if you operate this software, if the patient operates the software in real time, and a musician also can see simultaneously the same screen that the patient is seeing, the, the patient can direct the play of another musician so they can express themselves to the play of another musician. And in fact, uh, as an outworking of this, uh, Eduardo Miranda formed something called the, the Paramusical Ensemble, where the Bergeson String Quartet will travel with four patients like Rosemary Johnson, who will actually conduct performances where the patients are actually selecting the notes and the phrasing, and the musicians are playing along. And you can imagine how transformative a, a technology like this could actually be, right? Uh, it, to be trapped in your own body, not able to communicate, and suddenly have that ability to communicate. And just so you can get a, a sense for just how amazing uh, this technology is, there's a short video clip I want to show you of Rosemary Johnson directing the play of her close friend who was with her, or performed with her when she was with the Welsh National Opera Orchestra. And the first person you're going to hear from in this video clip is the neuroscientist Eduardo Miranda. So let's uh, just watch this. You know, it took 20 years. It would not have been achieved if I had not the chance to work with Rosie. The idea of playing with Rosie again after so many years was something I never imagined would be possible. Amazing, isn't it? That gives you a sense for the power and the impact of this kind of technology. In fact, this work falls underneath the umbrella of a project of a, of a research project that involves the generation or the creation of computer brain interfaces, which again are devices that allow patients to control computer software and computer hardware with their minds. And the work isn't just limited to the work of Eduardo Miranda. Uh, for example, there's a team at UC Berkeley that's looking to do something similar, except they want to be able to allow patients to communicate with words by allowing them, again, to select words with their minds uh, from software and then use uh, text-to-speech conversion algorithms so that they are able to speak, even though, again, they're locked in. And this particular work was, is rather extensive and complex, but essentially what these, team, these researchers are doing at UC Berkeley is piggybacking on a procedure that is done preoperatively before treating people that are epileptic. 
many times what they'll do, the surgeons will do is to kill regions of the brain that are responsible for the seizures. But before you can do that, you've got to map out brain function in detail so you don't wind up doing more damage than good. And so these researchers essentially inserted 256 electrodes into uh, the, the regions of the brain involved in, in speech and language and had the patients read, sorry, sorry, listen to conversation for 10 minutes and then read words aloud and then read words to themselves. And they monitored the electrical activity of the brain doing that. And then they were able to decode that with mathematical algorithms so that, again, the patients could communicate with their minds in a way to, to be able to allow them to, to speak. And in fact, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine recently, a research team essentially used this technology for the first time to allow a patient suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease to be able to speak uh, using, again, this kind of computer brain interface technology. Uh, this technology is also going to be used and, and is, in the, is being developed and it will be used in the future to revolutionize how we treat patients that are amputees because patients can learn to control robotic prosthetic limbs with their minds, again, through computer brain interface technology. And you can even do really interesting things like interface the, the robotic limb with what's called electronic skin that can convert sensory information from the environment into electrical signals that then get transmitted to the brain of the patient, and the patient can learn to interpret those signals in a way that gives them ownership of the limb and allows them to have fine motor control. Uh, this is going to, again, revolutionize how we treat people that are paraplegic and quadriplegic, where, uh, again, patients with their minds in a computer brain interface can control exoskeletons that will gain them the capacity for movement. Uh, something else that also is interesting is that computer brain interface technology can be used to treat Parkinson's disease, where continuous electrical stimulation to certain regions of the brain can actually arrest the Parkinson's symptoms. And this may also provide a treatment for Alzheimer's patients, where intermittent stimulation to other regions of the brain can improve memory and cognition. And so this, these are really, really exciting advances that are happening in this area of bioengineering. But uh, even though this technology can be used for incredible good, uh, it also can be used at, to enhance or augment human beings beyond our natural biological limits. The same technology that can be used to treat an amputee or somebody who is a quadriplegic or a paraplegic could be used to enhance a normal, healthy person's strength, physical strength, uh, by giving them essentially a robotic limb in place of their natural biological limb that could, again, enhance their strength. Uh, if uh, electrical stimulation to the brain can improve memory and cognition in an Alzheimer's patient, what could it do for a healthy individual? Could it, ex it actually make them uh, have an enhanced intelligence, again, beyond natural biological limits. And so this prospect of using this technology for biomedicine, but also because this technology can be a stepping stone to augmentation and enhancements of human beings, uh, is giving credibility to an intellectual idea called transhumanism. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with transhumanism. Uh, a few people. Uh, a lot, I'm, I'm finding a lot of people have not heard of this idea. Uh, or if you have heard of this idea, you think of it in the context of science fiction. But as I said, transhumanism is an intellectual movement where the, the fundamental premise is that we have a moral obligation to use science and technology to essentially augment uh, human beings beyond our natural biological limits, to make us smarter, uh, more psychologically well-adjusted, adjusted physically stronger. And in fact, people that are transhumanists will argue that we have really an obligation to take control of our own evolution using technology to modify human beings to the point that we would create essentially post-human species, where we would take control of our own evolution and again alter humanity to the degree that we would not recognize ourselves as human beings any longer. 
really ushering in a post-human era. Uh, this is what James Hughes says. He's a sociologist and a leading transhumanist voice. In his book, Citizen Cyborg, uh, Hughes says, in the 21st century, the convergence of artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and genetic engineering will allow human beings to achieve things previously imagined only in science fiction. Lifespans will extend well beyond a century. Our senses and cognition will be enhanced. We will gain control over our emotions and memory. We will merge with machines, and machines will become more like humans. These technologies will allow us to evolve into varieties of post-humans and usher us into a transhuman era in society. Transhuman technologies, technologies that push the boundaries of humanism, can radically improve our quality of life, and we have a fundamental right to use them to control our bodies and our minds. This is essentially uh, the transhumanist vision. And um, the, 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 the idea of transhumanism is not a new idea. It actually traces its birth, at least in its modern conception, to uh, the early 1900s and the work of J.B.S. Haldane, who was a British geneticist. He was one of the, the founders of the, the scientific discipline of genetics. And Haldane wrote a book called The Atlas, which was a, a futuristic look at where the science of genetics would one day lead, according to Haldane. And he projected that in the future, we would develop enough understanding of human genetics that we could actually use that understanding to alter our own genetic makeup, creating designer human beings. In fact, he went one step further and projected uh, or uh, the idea that one day we would develop artificial womb technology that would allow us to essentially divorce the process of human reproduction from the, 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 from the human being, where uh, essentially we would genetically manipulate humans at will and then essentially incubate them in a laboratory setting to create a society of people with specific skill sets. And in fact, this idea was the, the inspiration for Huxley's book, Brave New World. But this idea of essentially transhumanism has always been considered kind of a fringe idea that nobody really took seriously, or very few people took seriously. But thanks to advances like we're seeing with computer brain interface technology, this idea is now moving into the academic mainstream and is very quickly filtering down into our culture at large. But ultimately, the idea of transhumanism really has its genesis with the Enlightenment and what the, the goal of the Enlightenment project was, which is to essentially use the, the, the burgeoning discipline of science to allow us to take control of the world that we live in. Uh, Rene Descartes writes, we could know the power and action of fire, water, air, and the stars, the heavens, and all other bodies in our environment as distinctly as we know the different crafts of our artisans. And we could use this knowledge as the artisans use theirs for all the purposes for which it is appropriate and thus make ourselves, as it were, the lords and masters of nature. And so the, the idea behind the Enlightenment was that we would gain enough understanding of the world around us that we could literally, through science and technology, force the world to conform to our will as human beings that we would become the lord and masters of nature. And what we're seeing with transhumanism is this idea that we're going to extend this lordship to human biology, where we become also the lords and masters of our own biology. Uh, this idea that science and technology can lead to human progress, can lead to human flourishing, can potentially minimize human pain and suffering, is referred to by some scholars as techno-faith, where what is happening is that we begin to look to science and technology as the way to solve our fundamental problems, the problems that we are confronted with as individuals and as a society. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, the ultimate problem that we face as human beings is our, own, is our own mortality. And many people who are transhumanists would argue that we can use this technology to enhance our life expectancy indefinitely, maybe attain some kind of practical immortality 
where now we're looking to science and technology as the mode for our salvation. And I suspect that in the decades to come, this is going to become a competitor to the gospel because we live in a secular world, an increasingly secular world. We live in a world where we already turn to science and technology to solve problems. We live in a world <coughs> where we have a very high regard for science and technology. And so it's going to be a very winsome and appealing message for people to hear that science and technology can usher in our own salvation. Uh, and so for people that are materialists, that are naturalists, that are atheists, uh, it's a, the, the, the transhumanist vision, in a sense, represents their eschatology. And if you are a naturalist, a materialist, an atheist, it's really a very bleak worldview, right? Because there is no meaning, there is no hope, there is no purpose, there is no destiny, that when we die, we just simply uh, fade into oblivion. And yet, what we see with transhumanism is now a, an idea that represents a hopeful outcome, a hopeful look towards the future for somebody who is a materialist, who is uh, an atheist. And the idea that we could somehow use this technology to extend our life expectancy, again, perhaps indefinitely, is the type of vision that Ray Kurzweil has advocated with his concept of the singularity, which is the idea that one day technology would progress to the point that we would be able to upload our minds into some kind of machine framework and essentially attain a, a, an immortality, a digital immortality, and that in fact, if we are able to upload our minds into a machine, we would become free of our limits as biological organisms, and this would allow human beings to occupy all kinds of, air, all, all kinds of places uh, in our solar system and beyond. And if you think this idea of Kurzweil is, again, science fiction is, and is something to dismiss, or Kurzweil thinks by 2040 we're going to be able to achieve this, think about what is also cap we're capable of doing with computer brain interfaces because there are now experiments underway in animals as well as in human test subjects where they're looking at tethering people's brains together with computer brain interfaces, where through the use of Bluetooth technology and the internet, you can have humans that can, in principle, communicate thoughts to one another through, again, uh, these computer brain interfaces, and they can do it in remote locations. There's a, a classic experiment that was done uh, at the University of Washington where two test subjects were in different parts of the campus and one test subject with his, with his mind could control the, the hand movement of another test subject on the other side of the campus. And, and in fact, in animal studies, uh, uh, researchers have shown that rats can begin to work together using computer brain interfaces so that they can actually enhance their, their brain computational power solving problems that they're confronted with. And again, this, is, uh, this kind of work gives credibility to the, the vision that Kurzweil has. And again, if you think this is something that is, again, out of bounds or is something that we're never going to achieve, I would just like for you to watch this very short clip from a TED Talk given by Jason Sosa, who is the, the chief executive officer of a company called Immersive. So here is uh, Jason Sosa. Computer chips won't just be in your laptop or in your phone. Doctors will implant them in our brains and they'll restore sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. Today, there are already 300,000 people with cochlear implants. It's a form of a neural prosthetic that allows certain types of deaf people to hear. And Michio Kaku describes brain implants as your very own augmented mind. And this is the beginning of the brain net, a possible successor to the internet, a form of virtual telepathy that will allow you to create music, drive a car, communicate with other people, and even surf the web at the speed of thought. Movies will no longer be these two-dimensional slate tablets that you look into and blast sound at you. They'll be fully immersive experiences, complete with feeling and emotion the way the director originally intended. 
Everything is stored, every memory recorded, and available on a cloud service. And mind uploading will allow your friends to share their digital vacation experiences that never actually took place. It all just happened in their mind. Similar to Total Recall. So when you see, <laughs> when you see ideas like that that are now really within grasp, given the advances that are happening in technology, you really begin to see how people could legitimately turn to, again, science and technology as the source or the hope for their salvation. And so this idea of the singularity being near is actually, again, an, an idea that has gained very quickly credibility. But these kind of perspective um, advances where, again, biomedical applications could be used for human enhancement, human augmentation, is not limited to computer brain interface technology. We're really seeing a convergence of a number of technologies that are all in support of the transhumanist vision. So for example, uh, there have been recent advances in uh, CRISPR gene editing technology. And this, this technology is a very powerful technology that allows researchers to, with high precision and versatility, modify the genetic makeup or the genomes of organisms. And this technology is easy to use, it's inexpensive, and, it's, it, and the advances that are happening in CRISPR gene editing are occurring at a breakneck rate. And so not only can we modify the, the, the genomes of organisms at will, but we can use the same technology to modify human genomes. And in fact, people are looking at this technology as a way to treat genetic disorders with the idea that you could replace defective genes with healthy versions of that gene uh, through this technology. And this is, again, going to be revolutionary because researchers estimate there's somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 genetic disorders that involve a mutation in a single gene. And the, many of these genetic disorders are rare where there's very little work being done on how to treat those diseases. And with this technology, you could literally, again, transform people's lives who are suffering from genetic disorders. But this same technology can also be used to genetically modify or genetically enhance a human being, making them, again, smarter, uh, more psychologically well-adjusted, and stronger. There are advances that are happening in nanotechnology and other areas of biotechnology, like, for example, with stem cell biology, where this technology can be used to create replacement cells and replacement tissues that, again, can be used to treat diseases and debilitating injuries, but also can be used as anti-aging technology, extending a human life expectancy into the range of hundreds of years. And so these advances, again, are giving a credibility to the transhumanist vision where this is a reality that is going to be part of our world uh, in the near future, uh, and it's going to be a mainstream idea, whether we like it or not. And so the question on the table today is, how do we engage this idea as Christians? How do we engage this idea from a Christian worldview perspective? How do we respond to this, the, 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 this emerging competitor to the gospel? And the reason why I wrote the book Humans 2.0 was to begin that conversation about how do we engage this idea as, as a Christian community. And there's a, there are three areas that we focused on in the book. Uh, there's many, many other areas that in which we could, again, look to how we would engage this idea. But the three areas that we focused on in the book was uh, the idea that there are a number of ethical problems that are going to emerge as a result of this, uh, of this new uh, biotechnology and bioengineering capabilities, not only in a biomedical context, but also with respect to human enhancements and transhumanism. And so if we are able to effectively participate in ethical decision-making uh, as a Christian community, we can help to shape the technology in such a way that it's used for good purposes as opposed to being misused to fulfill uh, maybe uh, uh, a vision of the future that isn't necessarily optimal. Uh, also, this idea of transhumanism raises challenges for the idea of human exceptionalism. And then finally, 
again, it, it raises challenges with respect to the gospel itself. And so this evening, I'm, I'm not going to address all of these. Uh, I'm just going to sample uh, a couple of them just to give you an idea of some of the ways that I think we can engage this idea well. Because the last thing that I think I want, the last thing I want to see is for the Christian community to do what it characteristically does when it comes to emerging technology, which is either to ignore it, acting as if it's not ever going to really happen, and then it happens whether we want it to or not, and then we're playing catch up, or just to summarily condemn it. Uh, because this technology is complex, and in terms of its application, it can be used for incredible good or for nefarious purposes. So we want to be engaging this idea in a way that when, in terms of the development and the application of the technology, we can steer it in a way that it's going to ensure it's used for the best possible good. And what's interesting to me is that uh, bioethicists that are working in this area are at the point where they're throwing up their, their hands in the air. And many of these are, are bioethicists are working from a, a secular perspective, but they are essentially pointing out two things. One is the advances are happening so rapidly that we don't have time to effectively deliberate on them from an ethical standpoint. But secondly, there's not categories that help it to guide the decision making from an ethical standpoint. And I'm not going to detail the ethical issues associated with this. We do that in the book. But I imagine sitting here, you can already start to think, you're already probably thinking through all kinds of ways in which this technology can go wrong or can be misused. Um, but the question on the table is this. Uh, does the Christian faith actually have anything to contribute to these bioethical types of discussions? And I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, because even though the, the Christian worldview produces an ethical system that is 2,000 years old, that was produced in a time where nobody could even in their wildest dreams conceive of this kind of technology, the ethical system that flows out of the Christian worldview is robust enough that it can actually uh, help us make decisions about how to use this emerging technology. And it's all because the ethical system that is the basis for the, the or sorry, the, the, the idea that's the basis for the Christian ethical system is essentially the idea that human beings are made in God's image. And this is an incredibly powerful concept that has broad-ranging implications, uh, but the one that is of most importance when it comes to biotechnology is this idea that every human life has intrinsic worth and value. And on top of that, though, the Christian worldview, uh, also because of the image of God, has a prominent role for science and technology. Because we have been, because we're image bearers, we've been granted dominion over the creation. And because we've been demand, granted dominion over the creation, and also been given the responsibility to subdue the earth and to be caretakers of the, of the planet, it means that we have to understand the world that we live in in order to carry out those responsibilities, in order to be rulers over the planet. And that mean, motivates science and it motivates technology development. And so what we see with, with the Christian worldview is simultaneously a high regard for human life, but a very strong motivation to pursue science and technology. And so this leads to what I would call the Christian mandate, which is to protect human life, to honor human dignity, to promote human flourishing, to alleviate human suffering, and also at the same time to engage in discovery and to pursue technology development. This is, this is our our mandate because we are image bearers. And that means that when it comes to biotechnology, as Christians, we should, we should naturally support these kind of advances. We should participate in these kind of advances. We should encourage young people in the church to pursue careers in biotechnology and bioengineering, to participate in advancing these technologies. But we also recognize that the applications of these technologies do have to have restrictions, do have to be restrained in such a way that we never are going to allow a human life to be sacrificed. We're not going to allow human beings to be exploited. We're not going to do things to undermine human dignity or to compromise human identity. 
And I would actually think that um, these, these combination of ideas would be very appealing to our culture and our world today, where we're not, again, condemning the technology, but we want to be people that support the technology, but our message is that we want the technology to be used in a way that ensures its just application. And, and this is the power of the Christian worldview. And my hope is that this is the approach that we take as a church as we begin to engage this idea. Because I think if people recognize the power of the Christian worldview to guide ethical decision-making, in, 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 again, in a way that encourages the development of the technology in its best application, it's going to make the Christian worldview look appealing and the Christian faith look appealing. Uh, because I think it's important not to underestimate just how poorly non-believers view people who are evangelicals when it comes to science and technology. It, and so we, if we can change that perception, uh, it, it will go a long way towards advancing the Christian worldview and the gospel. And again, um, it's, it, we don't have to do anything that is outside the, the mandate that God has given us. Now, to me, what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about and what, what's most important is how do we make the gospel relevant and fresh in a world that is going to be influenced by the transhumanist gospel? And <clears throat> there are two things that we need to do. The first is that we need to be able to show that transhumanism is a false gospel. And th these, these, th th it feels harsh for me to say that. Um, we want to do this in a way that is winsome and in, in in appealing while we point out the fact that science and technology can never save us. And we have a, a, a wonderful ally in, in the scholarship that's been produced in the history and the philosophy of technology. Because scholars working in this area, regardless of their worldview, will point out that as human beings, we have an uneasy relationship with technology. We have a complex relationship with technology. Technology has allowed us as human beings to dominate the planet, to become the, the dominant species on the planet. Technology allows us to occupy virtually every environment on the planet, to thrive in these environments. Technology has allowed us to produce civilizations. It's allowed us to, to put people on the moon. And so technology defines us in many respects as a, as a species. Uh, but at the same time, we also recognize that technology is a, is a double-edged sword. It's a curse, it's, sorry, it's a blessing and it's a curse. Uh, and so it's, I, it's very easy to show, again, that, that technology many times is designed to free us up from the demands of physical labor, but at the same time will actually enslave us. And, and a, a wonderful example is the internet. I can remember when there wasn't an internet. You know, and then Al Gore invented it, and <laughs> sorry, that was just a, a cheap shot, but, but, um, but I can remember when there wasn't an, inter an internet, and I can remember when the internet began to be, to, where there were, were internet applications beginning to develop for the internet, and how uncertain and easy people were. I can remember the first time I bought a book from Amazon, it just didn't feel right, you know, to, to, to do something like that, it felt, I didn't quite trust the process, right? And, and now the internet has become essentially a, an integral part of our economic system. It's, it's, we, all of our essential services are dependent on the internet. So, but, so the internet has been an incredible time-saving device. It has improved efficiency. It's driving our economy. But what happens if suddenly the internet went down around the world? I mean, literally, it, 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 everything would come to a grinding halt. We are literally now enslaved to this technology that we've created. Uh, on top of that, oh, well, well, here's Brent Waters uh, in, in regard to the Industrial Revolution, but this applies broadly when it comes to technology. The science which had promised to liberate humans from the shackles of superstition and fossilized tradition was instead serving as a cruel taskmaster. Uh, David Velo Curtis, a, a philosopher, says, we create technologies to liberate us from the problems of physical labor, but these technologies inevitably create the unique problems of living in a technological society rife with pollution, psychological stress, and bureaucratic coldness. 
And so the problem here is that, you know, not only do we become enslaved to the technology that we create, but then on top of that, many times technology introduces new problems that never existed before. And so while we solve one set of problems, new problems emerge, and what do we do? We develop technology to solve those problems, which in turn creates a new set of problems. And so it's this never-ending uh, sequence of events. Uh, uh, one philosopher compared uh, this problem to uh, a person trapped in quicksand. The more that you try to move to get out, the deeper you become trapped in, into the quicksand. Um, also, there are unintended consequences uh, that, that happen when we develop technologies. Uh, you know, and, and the more powerful the technology is, the more potentially devastating or damaging the unintended consequences might be. Uh, David Below Curtis uh, summarizes it this way, each technology gives and takes away. Despite our good intentions, all technologies manifest harmful side effects. And in spite of our bad intentions, even our most destructive inventions may be re-engineered for good. By adding to our lives, technologies by necessity also subtract from them. Now, to me, if there is something that transhumanists are guilty of, it's their, their uh, unrealistic optimism in, in the human condition and in humanity. Because transhumanists somehow don't have any concept of the fact that human beings are sinful. And this is something that, as Christians, we can bring to the conversation because we recognize that human beings, again, are sinful. And that means that we have this propensity as human beings to take, everything, to take things that are good and turn them into things that cause damage, that do evil. And again, the more powerful the technology, the, the, the more devastating these effects are. Uh, Ronald Cole Turner, a, a theologian, says, transhumanists seem a little naive about the human predicament and therefore overly optimistic about what it takes to engineer solutions. What theologians call sin, humanity's unexplained but inescapable tendency to pervert and destroy even its best achievements, is missing from transhumanist thought and also absent in any realistic attitude about how well and at the same time how badly things will go as we make progress towards improving our lives and our species. Our technological power is great and is growing quickly but it is never pure, never characterized by a singularity of purpose in pursuit of the good. If this self-sabotaging inner disorder is a limitation of our biology, it is one we seem unwilling or unable to transcend, all the more so because too rarely do we admit it's real. And so the point here is this, is that transhumanism is essentially a false gospel. And I think we need to be able to articulate this idea uh, as we engage our culture particularly for people that, again, are turning to transhumanism as, a, as the mode for their salvation. And, and, and the, the, the wonderful thing is that, again, we have an ally in the work that's been done in the history in the philosophy of technology. Now, we also want to be able to advance the gospel in, in a world shaped by the transhumanist vision. And, and to me, this is actually really easy to do, I believe, because think about what transhumanists desire. The whole motivation for the transhumanist vision is they want a utopian world. They realize that the world that we live in is not the way it's supposed to be. They see pain and suffering that they want to correct, they want to alleviate. They want to see human flourishing. They want to see human progress. These are our wonderful ideal goals, to be certain. And Ultimately, transhumanists recognize that death is not natural, that, that they, they see death as interruptive. They, they see a purpose to individual lives as human beings. They see a purpose to humanity as a species to the point where they feel compelled to do everything they can with science and technology to extend life expectancy, to try to allow our species to escape extinction. It's just that they're turning to technology and science as the mode for the salvation as opposed to the person of Christ. But what we, I see happening with transhumanism is that science and technology are lay, laying bare the need that every human being has 
for the gospel itself. And we need to be able to articulate the gospel in this context. Again, Ronald Cole Turner says this, there are notable similarities between Christianity and transhumanism. Christians hope for eternal life that will be enjoyed with the fullest possible knowledge, joy, and moral purity. Transhumanists look forward to extending the human lifespan, perhaps indefinitely, while also enriching human knowledge, attaining greater happiness, if not joy, and achieving moral balance and social harmony. One explanation for these similarities is that transhumanism emerged from a culture shaped by Christianity. Another is that the yearnings of Christians and transhumanists, if not quite universally shared by all human beings, are broadly held and find their own expression in both contexts. And so again, I see transhumanism as an incredible opportunity to build a bridge to the gospel in our culture. Uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, to, to show the, the relevance of the gospel. Ronald Cole Turner finally says this, technology can lead us to the erroneous notion that the only problems to which it is worth paying attention involve engineering. When we let this happen, we reduce human yearning for salvation to a mere desire for enhancement, a lesser salvation that we can control rather than the true salvation for which we must also wait. Again, transhumanism is an incredible opportunity for us to present the gospel. And in, in, in reality, Christianity is transhumanism, is it not? Because part of the hope that we have, part of the promise that we have with the gospel is that one day we will have glorified bodies where we will overcome our biological limits um, and, in, and we will have eternal life in the presence of uh, the Lord. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun is one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and stars differ from star in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So um, that is the hope that we have. That is the hope that we have. Um, I, while we transition to a time of, of Q&A, uh, just a quick commercial. <laughs> uh, actually, um, just as a way to say thank you for having us here at Southeastern, if you want to go to the book table and fill out this card, uh, we will give you uh, as a gift uh, a video of um, my story of how I came to faith in Christ and the role that biochemistry played in my conversion. And then as part of this video, I talk about also why I believe God exists based on advances in biochemistry and origin of life research. And then also uh, I have with me... Uh, uh, George Haraxon, who works at Reasons to Believe. And uh, uh, George is part of our uh, scholar community, as is uh, Dr. Keithley. And uh, at Reasons to Believe, we are in the process of establishing what we call a scholar community, which is a, a group of scholars from a wide range of disciplines, science, engineering, medicine, philosophy, theology, biblical studies, uh, the, the list goes on with the idea that this is a community of scholars that is, again, organized around uh, the work that we do at Reasons to Believe, but we are trying to, to create a community of what, we'll call, what we call scholar evangelists who look as part of their ministry to share the gospel in their sphere of influence as scholars. And so the purpose of the community is to encourage and to equip uh, one another towards that task. So if you have any interest in what the scholar community is about, uh, or would like to be part of our scholar community, it's, a, I, I, I think, an incredible experience for people that are part of that community. Um, just please see George, and there's a, a brochure that we have at the table, but see George and give George your contact information, and we'll follow up with you. Okay, so anyway, uh, 
Well, this has been a great, great talk. And so um, Kimberly and is going to have the microphone. And so if you have a question, raise your hand, say your first name, and then ask your question. Right over here, Elizabeth has a question. What? Say my name. Elizabeth, um, <laughs> when you said that your dad was a nuclear scientist, that made me think. Um, that was kind of, you know, they call it the, the nuclear genie that got out of the bottle. That kind of went beyond anybody's control, and now other nations have that. They, we, it just makes me wonder, all of this technology, like, who's really in control of it? Is it universities? Is it government? Is it business? And do we really have any opportunity at all to influence this, yeah. or is this just going to be foisted on us? So that's a great question. Who, who, who's guiding, who's, who's watching over uh, the biotech revolution? Yeah, yeah well, um, I mean, your example of uh, nuclear energy is a wonderful example that illustrates the point that, you know, philosophers and historians of technology will point out in terms of the double-edged relationship uh, between, that we have with, with technology. And, you know, the, the difference between nuclear technology and what we're seeing with this emerging biotechnology is accessibility. And I mean, it's hard even for the most, for, for rogue countries to really truly develop nuclear capabilities. Uh, I mean, they can, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do, even though the knowledge to how, uh, in terms of how to do that is, is widely understood and widely available. The problem is, that, for example, with CRISPR gene editing, is that the technology is so powerful and so easy to use and so inexpensive. How, what does it cost to get it on Amazon? You told me today. You can, you can buy on Amazon a CRISPR gene editing kit for 150 bucks, 169 bucks, and have it delivered if you have Amazon Prime to your house the next day and that evening do a CRISPR gene editing experiment on your kitchen counter. Now, it's, 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 a, it's a fairly uh, simple experiment where you're, you know, you're not doing anything that really is dangerous with it. But that just illustrates how inexpensive and easy to use the technology is. And in fact, um, the CRISPR technology has given rise to um, the, what's called the biology DIY movement, the biology do-it-yourself movement, where the, the argument is that, the, that, that this kind of technology should not be in the hands of the scientific elites only that everybody should have access to the technology, everybody should have the right to the technology, and they should have the right to use it to alter themselves in any way they choose to do so. And, and so there are these community labs that are popping up where people are getting their hands as lay people, uh, non-scientists on this, with this technology, and they're going to these laboratories and they're doing CRISPR gene editing in an unregulated manner. In fact, um, there's a biochemist uh, by the name of Josiah Zayner, who's one of the pioneers in this biology DIY movement. And he actually, uh, at a foresight conference, set up a booth and, and in public injected himself with CRISPR, with, with a CRISPR gene editing kit using a, a, a gene editing kit that disabled a gene called myostatin, which codes for a protein that regulates muscle growth and development. And so he announced the, that he was the first person to ever uh, do gene editing on himself. And so, the, so the, the, the concern I have is not with the scientific community that has some understanding as to probably what we should or shouldn't do. My concern is this technology is going to be, is going to fall, is, is already in the hands of people that probably don't really know what they're doing with it. But it's very easy to begin to see how you could have these companies popping up all over the world that would actually start to offer uh, gene editing services with an eye towards human enhancement in designer babies. In fact, I could even see some countries encouraging this where they would create a genetic tourism industry. The same thing is true with computer brain interfaces. The, the, the technology for that type of thing is so inexpensive that again, it's accessible, broadly accessible. So there are, in, 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 um, there are these people that are called grinders that will actually incorporate electronic interfaces into their bodies. Uh, Kevin Warwick, who's a highly respected 
electrical engineer, um, Oxford or Cambridge or something like yeah, that, yeah. Is, is pioneering this particular movement. And so this is the real concern, right? Is, is this is, and, and when you think about what can be done with this technology, the power of this technology, this is what's really frightening, is that it's so inexpensive and powerful and accessible that it's, it's worse than nuclear power, right, in terms of, of, of what could go wrong. Um, so so uh, the, the Chinese doctor that, was, that got, in, got in trouble recently, what type of experiments was he doing with gene editing? Yeah, it was, again, these were CRISPR experiments, and the scientist that did this it, is a highly reputable scientist. He was at Stanford University, and he was the first researcher to do uh, CRISPR gene editing on a human embryo. And this was when he was in the United States, and what he did is he took um, embryos that uh, were uh, produced through in vitro fertilization, but occasionally what happens is you wind up with an embryo that has three nuclei instead of two nuclei from the sperm and the egg that fuse to form the, the nucleus. And so these are abnormal uh, embryos. And so he did gene editing on those embryos showing that the gene editing technique would work and figured out how to, to improve its efficiency. And then he was recruited by, into China to do this, continue this work. And so what he did is he used CRISPR to disable a gene that, um, codes for a receptor protein that is on the cell surface, and that is the protein that the AIDS virus will bind to and provide entry into the cell. And um, he disabled that, that gene for that receptor protein. And th uh, the reason he did that is because there are, have been other studies done showing that people that are resistant to the HIV virus have a mutation in that particular receptor protein gene, and it doesn't seem like they suffer any other ill health effects. So his idea was that we're going to be able to create human beings that are resistant to the HIV virus, which is a growing problem in China, by the way, the spread of AIDS. And so what he, what he, he did the gene editing on the embryo, which in and of itself is bad enough, but if he stopped there, nobody probably would have thought twice. But what he then did is he took those embryos and he, he essentially implanted them in a woman and she gave birth, you know. So this is the type of thing that we're talking about where you can have rogue scientists doing these kind of things um, and, and setting up commercial operations, you know, to provide these services. So uh, nobody's regulating it. I mean, there's, I mean, you have these government organiz or the, sorry, these scientific organizations that will issue guidelines, will issue moratorium, but the people that are going to adhere to those guidelines and, those, that, and the moratoriums when they're announced are people that you don't have to worry about anyway, right? It's the people that are not going to listen to those are the people that you have to worry about. So this is a, this is a very real problem to be certain, you know, um, and this is all the more reason why as, as Christians we need to articulate the idea that your hope is not found in gene editing you know, it's, it's found in the Christ. Very good question. Next question. If you have a question, raise your hand. There's a question in the back there. Say your first name and ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Gabriel. Um, my question was about the Imago Dei. Uh, just so as transhumanism advances, um, theoretically in the next few decades, people are re replacing more and more body parts or pieces of their mind. Where's the line with man and machine fall? So if you're asking, if I think what you're asking, if, if every part of your body was replaced one at a time by something mechanical, at what point do you still, are you still human and have the Imago Dei? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, you know I, I, I say that, you know, you know, but, 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 but I mean, but transhumanism is, go, is going to, be job security for theologians and philosophers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, I mean, be, be, because, I mean, you know, this is a, this is a really profound question that you're asking. And I've, I've spent a couple of years thinking about this and I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you know, in a sense, I mean, the, the image of God is, Im, I think, is, a, is a, an immaterial 
part of our being, right? And so there's going to be no amount of modification that you're going to do to a human being that's going to impact the immaterial aspect of our nature. But we're not, you know, ghosts in a machine, to use pejorative a term that George pointed out. <laughs> Descartes, it, 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 they, was it they, as Descartes? Descartian or yeah. Cartesian dualism or whatever, but so, but I mean we, we I mean the image you know our immaterial as, aspect of our nature is interacting and intertwined with our the physical aspect of our nature, and so in that in that sense while you may not you know damage the image of God you may alter ourselves to the point where we, that 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 entwinement no longer. Is, is, is no longer functions or no longer exists. Um, and, and so to me, you know, I don't have a problem with computer brain interfaces for people that are quadriplegics or, you know, amputees. I actually don't even have a problem with people using computer brain interfaces to operate exoskeletons just to give themselves added strength. Uh, I, I spoke on this in, in Lima, Peru, and after I spoke, um, a guy came up to me who was a, 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 a PhD electrical engineer who had a company and they were building exoskeletons to be used to enhance human strength. And he was concerned, am I you know, out of bounds? Like, I don't think so. I don't think there's a problem with building exoskeletons for an enhancement, certain enhancement applications. But when you start talking about tethering our brains together with the brain net, now I'm beginning to wonder if that's a place where you just really may lose human identity. You know, intuitively it seems like that could, that would be the place where probably the greatest concern would re reside. But I mean, your question is a really profound question and I, I don't know the answer to this. And, and there's an enormous amount of work that has to be done, you know, in terms of thinking through what, what is the image of God in light of, in light of these kind of advances I think this is going to press on the mind-brain problem in very interesting ways as well. You know, so there's a lot of work to be done, you know, um, in terms of how do we how do we properly engage this? Where are the the boundaries? You know, and what you know, where do they lie? But. I can't help but think that uh, if God is going to call a generation of bioethicists to address this, that they they should be. One would expect they they'd be called from. Places like Southeastern, where we are trying to, to have a gospel-centered uh, uh, understanding of the human person under biblical authority, I think that, uh, you know, praying that God would call many uh, of you into those kinds of fields. Next question. But, but, or, go, ahead, go ahead. Let me ask a question. Does anybody have a thought on that? I'm just, we can have a little bit of a discussion. Yeah. Anybody, anybody have a thought on, Judd, how would you answer that question? Go for it, Judd. I was just going to say, um, I think that really boils down to, well, let's just say that you're born into a situation in which you have these transhumanism aspects and you never chose it. I think it would ultimately come down to what does purity look like? Because you certainly will, will still be responsible for your sin. It's not as if you're just off the hook because you're transhumanist. You know, you're born into this world, and I think that you would be responsible in front of God. What did you do? with what you were given. And so the Imago Dei, just because you were given some body part, isn't going to, in my opinion, just be eradicated. I think that you would still be called to live a life of purity. Okay. Nico? It's, um, it's kind of weird to think, like, I'm trying to organize my thoughts because it's, you know, what what is? I, it's more of a question than a comment, I think. But it's uh, it's hard to formulate because I you know I've never considered tethering brains, so trying to think of how to formulate a question about it is kind of weird. But need a tethering at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like where where do you if you have two brains that are tethered? The question is like, what is that connection? Because you, you, like, it's obviously communication because you can communicate thoughts, I think you, you, you said. But you also, like, 
can move the other person's body. And so, like, like thoughts are more than just words. Because you can, like, obviously right now I'm having thoughts, but I'm having trouble putting them into words. <laughs> so, so there's more to the thinking than just the words that it comes in. Right. But, so there is a communication, like, kind of opens up what communication can be. Like, you can communicate the, the, the mess in your head to the other person, and they'll just be stuck with that, too. But, um... Yeah, well, like, in, in, the, in the experiment what, what's where... What's happening, yeah. Yeah, in the experiment where you, you had one test subject controlling the arm movement of another, there you're, you're, the interface is actually in, like, the motor cortex or the, the premotor motor co cortex. So you might be able to regulate some of the the brain brain interfaces b by virtue of where you actually put the the interface right at, at least in the in the short term and and by the way that those the brain tethering does have a biomedical application some people think that if somebody suffers from a stroke and is trying to then go through uh, you know a rehabilitation process where they're trying to recover function the thought is that if you actually tether that person's brain to the brain of a healthy individual, and they actually think through what it takes to make that particular movement or to engage in that particular task, it'll actually help stimulate the, uh, the other brain and help to recover that capability. So, you know, it's, it's not again, black, or, or black and white, right? But Yes, quick. So where would you say that the the danger to the identity and like individual or human identity comes from? Uh, it, with the computer brain interfaces or just in general? The tethering. Well, I mean, I think if you're in a situation where you can begin to exchange thoughts with one another and you can even begin to affect the 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 the, the physical activity of one another, then you you you've kind of lost control. Right, and it's hard to know um, if you're interacting in a brain net who you are and you know who others are as individuals. Are you really now? Be have you really now become a, a collective? Right, you know where the um, so that that to me is where it, it intuitively feels like you're losing you know identity as a human being. Resistance is futile. Uh, next, you have to well, yeah you have to be an old Trekkie to to get that one. Uh, do we have another question? Yes, Dr. Williams up here at the front. I used to wonder when I was a little boy why this young woman that went to my church uh, wasn't allowed to have any children. And she had been sterilized by the state. You can tell I'm fairly old. And by people who thought, you know, using technology uh, thought they were doing what was best for the human race. The idea, uh, sort of a, a genocidal kind of thing to remove the kind of people that you don't think ought to be here. And it seems like that there's this intuitive idea whenever you see movies or things about the future with all the, it's always dark, you know, it's not really a happy looking yeah. kind of situation. Uh, and it, uh, those kinds of ideas led uh, ultimately to uh, Hitler and, and his desire to uh, remove a race. And I'm not sure that, uh, that, it's, that it's necessarily a good thing to promote this idea. Uh, and I think it's important to promote it if you're going to, uh, if you're going to uh, stand against it to do it in a in a scientific way. But I guess we really don't have to worry because the scientists uh, who say this is going to happen by 2040, well, by 2030, the other scientists, you know, the green idea, you know, the <laughs> green deal scientists say we'll be gone by then anyway, right? <laughs> Which scientists do we? But I'm really a pro scientist person, but. Uh, it just seems like we live, I, I preached a sermon yesterday uh, about how to uh, obtain peace of mind through uh, the passage in Philippians 4, 8, where God, you know, Paul told us God's way of having peace of mind. And I, I pointed out the widespread uh, 
growth of suicide and how there's such a lack of peace of mind. And then I named about three or four things, and I just thought every one of those is a result of technology. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. you know, we really, maybe we need to, yeah. you know, think about dealing with that in a, in a serious yeah. and an intellectual way. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it's just more of a comment than a question. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we, I mean you, you, you kind of bring up the idea of eugenics, and I think that's one of the, the real fears with the, 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 the gene editing capabilities that we have, particularly if you're looking at trying to eradicate genetic disorders from the human gene pool, because now you really are engaged in a, a type of eugenics where you're targeting not an, an, an ethnic group, but you're targeting people with genetic disorders, or right, and you're somehow saying that people that have a genetic def- defect are less valuable, or an, or they are a nuisance to society, and we need to do something to correct them. But there's a difference between using gene editing in that way versus doing using gene editing to let's say treat uh, a patient with cystic fibrosis, where you're administering the gene editing package, but you're targeting like let's say the lung cells with the idea that you can correct the genetic defect and, and ameliorate some of the symptoms. Th- that to me is really a therapeutic use of it where you're not altering fundamentally the genetic makeup of that individual, but rather you're just targeting, again, tissues that are displaying the... the right. So, so to me, that's where I think we want to be really supportive. But, it's, but again, it's so easy to blur the line between... Um, you know, a, a legitimate, you know, therapeutic use and then a, a therapeutic use that may begin to move us towards eugenics to enhancements. I mean, where does the, where does the line end, right, for therapeutic use and where does it begin for, you know, enhancements? And, and so, I mean, these are really, really concerning questions, right? And, and we don't want to be naive. I mean, you know, I, I want, you know, to me, I'm, again, I'm excited about these developments because I see enormous amount of good that can come from them, but we don't want to be naive either, right, about what, and that's why we've got to, en- we've got to engage with, with the Christian worldview because we've got something really important to, to say in light of what's happening, and, and we've got to position ourselves in a way that our voice is, is heard and, and, and people respond to the, the points that we make. <laughs> speaking of the book, speaking of the book, uh, George, what books are on the table there? There's two, I believe, right? Yeah, this afternoon, uh, Dr. Rana spoke in my theology class, and he spoke on the historical Adam. Uh, both books are in the table back there. Also, you said you had the uh, video, the DVD of your test. You do want to hear his testimony. It's a remarkable yep. testimony. Anything else you'd want to say about promoting uh, the table and the things back there? No, I think just check it out uh, and then see what we got there. Reasons to Believe is a wonderful uh, apologetics ministry. It's reasons.org. Is that correct? Reasons.org. If you'd like to find uh, more about uh, information about what Hugh and Jeff Zwink and others, uh, what uh, you know, that they have astronomers, astrophysicists, biochemists, uh, just a, a great uh, collection of believing scientists that I think are doing a wonderful work in promoting the gospel.